Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, Carmack leaves id, joins Oculus Rift, Xbox One is unboxed, the open power architecture, metal flake, paint, and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch this week in computer hardware episode 229, recorded August 8th, 2013. Can Carmack overclock Oculus Rift? This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Ting.com. Ting is a mobile phone service that makes sense. Save money with Ting. Pay for what you use, doesn't require a contract, and offers unlimited devices on one pooled plan. To save $25 on your first Ting device, visit twitch.ting.com. That's twitch.ting.com. And by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the internet the way it should be anonymous and unfiltered. For 20% off your new account, go to proxpn.com slash twit and use the code twitch. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most important and most useful news and answers to your questions about computer hardware, tablets, phones, and, well, just about anything else that involves running code on hardware. Well, we're a hardware show. Well, we like hardware. Well, let me start this over again, lest I go... Yo, one more time. In three, two, welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most important and informative news in computer tech. We talk about the computer hardware. We love the tablets. We love faster. We love more. And we love helping you get the best deal for your mother. Your mother? Your money. It can be <laughs> both. I your think mother, that's fair. We would like you to help get the best deal for your mother and your money, Mr. Ryan Shrout, saving me from myself once again. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing well, doing well. Recovered back, not no longer in Texas. Instead of it being 105 degrees, it's like 85 degrees. So that's that's a move in the right direction, I think. There was nothing wrong in Texas. Texas has the barbecue. Your issue, the reason your, your coat was not as shiny and glossy as usual, was the 15-hour drive back from Texas and getting home at, what, 3 in the morning, 5 in the morning? We, we got home at about 3.30. I got to my house at 3.30 a.m., so... Wow. Yeah, on Monday morning. And then, you know, I slept in until probably about nine-ish or something. So, I, you know, I went through a normal day. But glad to be back. It was a fun show. We had a good time. It was uh, the workshop went really well. Um, you know, we had about, I think, somewhere between 1,800 and 1,900 people there based on the, nice. the ticket counts and that kind of thing. So it went really well. We gave away about close to twenty four, almost $25,000 with the hardware, had some cool demos and stuff to show off. And, uh, you know, the best part was, is, uh, you know, people coming up and say, hey, uh, I watch every week on Twitch or I watch every week on the podcast and read the websites. It's, it's really cool to meet people that actually listen and, and apparently people watch and listen to the stuff that we produce, which is a positive thing. Makes it, it's like there's somebody out there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. And we love the chat room, too. Yep. Even though the chat room is... Behind the IRC. Uh, it's kind of funny. Last week, uh, obviously, QuakeCon, big deal. Uh, Carmack had a keynote at Quake, uh, QuakeCon, not a particularly shocking thing. No. And then suddenly, days later, uh, Carmack leaves id Software to become the CTO for Oculus Rift. Uh, and, of course, almost at the exact same time, id Software tweets, Happy to say at id, AA Carmack is not leaving id and will continue to provide leadership for our games and development. Um, but, uh, I, I think as we were discussing earlier, uh, Oculus VR is going to be the primary thing occupying the gigantic and incredibly powerful brain of John Carmack. Right. What's, what, what do you think he's going to do? At, so, uh, I mean, if you think about it, uh, a year ago, he was mm -hmm. kind of really the spark that made Oculus VR take off, right? So the team behind right. Ocu Oculus VR had done a lot of work themselves. But John had been kind of at the same time trying to figure out head-mounted displays for years and years and, and mm -hmm. found this team's work and uh, really kind of brought it to light. Uh, John, you know, at the id Software booth at E3, not this past one, but the one previous, mm -hmm. you know, brought a bunch of media and said, hey, look at this cool thing. 
We had it working with uh, BFG or Doom 3 BFG edition. Uh, we're going to work with it. At the time, they said that when the Kickstarter began that they were going to include a copy of Doom 3 BFG with it uh, as right. one of the perks for it. And uh, then he came to QuakeCon and did the same thing, got up on stage, talked about the VR technology, talked about in particular Oculus and the Rift. Uh, they demoed it, his exact unit, at QuakeCon last year. Mm -hmm. So he's always been like a huge proponent of uh, the the you know the 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 Oculus team, right? Uh, Palmer, Lucky, and those guys that you know really started it and moved it forward. Right. And you know, I don't think without him, maybe they would have made their goal uh, for the Kickstarter, but I don't think it would have gotten nearly as much media attention as it did without him. So he was kind of instrumental in its success even before taking an official position there. So it's kind of interesting. It's not. It's not. It's surprising to me that he would leave id software, even though people will argue with me then whether or not he actually is leaving. He's obviously going to devote the strong, strong majority of his time to Oculus, followed mm -hmm. by id, followed by his Armadillo space program, right? Armadillo Aerospace that he started years ago as well. And right. well, Arm, Ar, he's, he's basically the Armadillo Aerospace is, is shut down because he had right. an amount of money he could spend on that. And he has basically spent it all. It, it's funny. It, it sounded like you or I might sound about this, you know, talking about like, you know, our, our weekend habit at the track or the, you know, right. the budget for ammunition for, you know, Palmer rifle shooting. Uh, and, and for him, his, his, his discretionary, you know, uh, I can piss it away. Budget was, you know, Alameda, or excuse me, not Alameda Aerospace. That's a former company in Alameda, uh, Armadillo Aerospace. So yeah. it was funny so, hearing him talk about this is the amount of money that my wife would let me spend before she said I would turn into the crazy, you know, millionaire that wastes all their money on space programs and stuff like that. So, you know, his, his move to, to Oculus, I think is, is interesting in that I think it's going to give that team a huge push forward. Right since the release of their developer kit, since they actually started getting these in people's hands, it feels like there's been a little bit of a slowdown in the last couple of months over cool demos, you know, PC games that have you know hacked in support for the Oculus VR. And he is a software genius. Obviously, he is going to right. you know help build these demonstrations, help get these game engines working with Oculus, and, and help get support for them uh, further along. And plus, I mean, he is probably knows everything about everything, so he's going to help with. How do we improve latency? How do we improve image quality? How do we improve, you know, people getting motion sickness from these devices? He's going to he's gonna dive into a lot of those areas. So it was really cool to see it. It's obviously, it was a little odd that it happened the day after QuakeCon was over, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is something that they didn't want to come out while everybody was in Dallas, while everybody was excited, while everybody, you know, was, was kind of like, ooh, what's, what's id software going to do next? What, what game engine tech is he working on? Um, and uh, it's a little disappointing. Now, if you think about it, he was the last of the original four founders of id Software. Right. And w whether or not you say he's gone from id Software or not, there are some John Carmack purists out there that have been arguing with me on Twitter about, he's not really gone. Don't you read the internet? It's like, well, you know, well, <laughs> Steve, Bill Gates is not technically gone from Microsoft, but does he work at Microsoft? No. Um, so, well, he's the chairman of the board and attends the board meetings, presumably, and would help set the direction and tone of the organization from that position. Yeah. Uh, but no, he won't fire Steve Ballmer, and Steve Ballmer seems to make all the random decisions that have guided Microsoft as of late. Um, sorry, yep. that sounded as obnoxious as it did outside my head as it did inside. <laughs> Well, okay, let's let's switch gears for a second, right? So Oculus Rift, if anybody's going to solve the technical challenges at Oculus Rift, I think uh, Carmack would yep. certainly be one to do that, which is, of course, the latency between movement and the image on that, that is hitting your eye and some of the issues. Basically, latency, I think, is 80% of the issue with the Oculus Rift, and the other 80% is, is applications that make people want to buy the Oculus Rift VR gear, and, and that's... Uh, that will be interesting to see how that turns out because uh, really cool apps seems to be something we've been talking a lot about with some of the more exciting hardware lately, which is like Oculus Rift. Will there be programs people want to, well, in the Oculus Rift, of course, there's the can they make a version that doesn't make Ryan want to puke, followed by yes. will there be a game that Ryan wants to play after they build an Oculus Rift that doesn't make him want to puke? Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, the, the ooh, yeah. Will there be more games? You know, right now there's one killer game for the the Ouya, and I see people playing it with four people going gangbusters yep. uh, in the gaming testing lab, you know, but there's like that app. 
So, you know, it's it, the, 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 the NVIDIA Shield. Okay, we got this thing. Are we going to have more controller-friendly games on Android because of the OUYA and the NVIDIA Shield? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of funny. Like, we love hardware, but without really good software, there's not a lot of point of having all of the incredible power at your fingertips. Um, interesting uh, post on The Verge today. Uh, Microsoft unboxes the Xbox One sort of day one release. Quote, the console connect and a branded day one controller are all present as you'd expect, but there's a surprise, a bundled Xbox One chat headset. Microsoft says both the day one and standard editions will include the mono headset, which is nice given the unbelievable amount of money you'll be spending to buy an Xbox One. Um, but uh, Doesn't it includes... It, I mean, it's, it's like the same cheap build as the Xbox 360 one, right? I mean, it's got to be... I mean, we're talking, we're talking about... <laughs> <laughs> maybe eight dollars bomb cost you, you know the, i mean it's not the like they included or some... for the entire thing <laughs> no no for the headset right yeah the you know headset. i don't think anybody I, you know it's the verge they get excited about stuff but it, it's kind of funny so separate power supply hdmi cable uh and a console that will have what Microsoft describes, and I'm, I'm quoting The Verge again here, as a liquid black finish uh, and basically all designed with a consistent 16 to 9 ratio in mind. Uh, and they claim the HDMI cable will support 4K, 1080B, and 3D, despite the same cables being available for as little as $5 at retailers. And I would like to point out, while we have seen more hardware shipping with HDMI cables in the box as of late, uh, it's still not a given. And it's nice that Correct. they want to make sure that, you know, out of the box, you will open the box. The out-of-box experience includes every single thing you will need to get the delete expletive device to run. Uh, I didn't watch nothing... all the unboxing, but it's also possible that this does not support anything but HDMI, right? Uh, I think it is HDMI only. Um, yeah, so, I mean, if they didn't include that, then they'd be... <laughs> really screwed over their customers. Uh, I, I thought it was funny. I did. I did hear the part where he said a 4K rated HDMI cable, and it's yeah. funny because we have 4K monitors here now, and every HDMI cable I have had hooked up has worked just fine at 4K. Yeah, so. uh, essentially 1.4 and it's the next. Yeah, well, HDMI 1.4 doesn't really exist. HDMI 1.3, 1.2 cables should work fine. It, it's it, Robert Heron can actually go on a fascinating. Actually, he did on HD Nation a couple weeks ago, where we talked about the myth and the bollocks uh, behind HDMI cable numbering and why you really probably don't need to worry. Like plug in your cable and if something doesn't work, then worry about upgrading your cable. Uh, I'm more interested yeah. to see what Microsoft does. Nobody has really talked about, like both consoles have said they have 4K support, but nobody has really talked about what that means. If I hook this up to a 4K TV, <laughs> do I get a 4K interface? It Does it well, upscale things? Does it just send to AP? to the TV well, and let the TV do the upscaling. It's kind of interesting. There's not, I mean, the, the truth is, is there's not enough 4K televisions in the world right now to make a difference, right? And it's like, so sure. 4K ostensibly is going to be quad 1080p. I'm curious, are they going to like quadruple the picture? Because they don't have, well, and let's let's take a, a, a side detour here before we go too far down the 4K rabbit hole. But it's kind of funny. The other article that was linked off that is that uh, uh, from earlier, uh, in August was Microsoft boosts the Xbox One graphics performance ahead of the PS4 console war. And you're like, oh, wow, more graphics performance on the Xbox One console. And it's, oh, uh, the GPU clock speed's gone from 800 megahertz to 853 megahertz. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, you know, both are running AMD Jaguar's processor. In theory, the PS4 has a modest advantage in GPU horsepower. Um, Quote, Microsoft change appears to be a reaction to that, allowing the company to up its graphics performance by about 6.5%. And later on, we'll probably see Miller switch to Tajivo on the mound. Tajivo's had a closing average of, you know what I mean? It's like, like, can you get more inside baseball than a 6.5%, you know, GPU performance increase? It's like, so they're, the they're, margin I mean, of statistical insignificance is 3%. Um. They're, they're trying <laughs> desperately, you know, everybody, because at this point, people are still making the decision they're going to buy the xbox they're going to buy the ps4 if they're looking at a new console so the the issue is people were talking about well the ps4 is going to be better graphically because we've we've talked about the difference in graphics core count and and what that means for the ps4 over the xbox one and so microsoft's probably looking at that going well we want we want to 
help lessen the fears that somehow the PS4 will be graphically superior to the Xbox One. So they're doing everything they can. It wouldn't come, wouldn't surprise me if, if something else like this were to be announced or you know talked about uh, just prior to launch as well. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, it's gonna be. I mean, I'm excited. I'm curious. Uh, if I hear one more person be like, I can't believe the Xbox One doesn't have 802.11 AC, I'm going to weep. Um, <laughs> there's just yeah. not enough 802.11 AC out there to really make it a, a particularly important choice. But Yep. And, you know, we'll we'll see when it ships. And, and, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious also because I'm, I'm really curious to see if, you know, PlayStation's trying to, Sony's trying to use the most advanced operating, or excuse me, the, the most advanced system memory technology that, that AMD has. And I'm really curious to see that ship uh, in volume on time, which may be just some of my terminal paranoia. Uh, involving uh, new technology for yeah. AMD, I, I have my moments, dude. I get paranoid. You're you're more of an optimist than I am, Ryan. <laughs> it's all the benchmarking. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> IBM open up. Excuse me. IBM opens up Power Chips ARM style to take on Chipzilla. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting, right? So, essentially, Power PC architecture doesn't have customers anymore. Is that is that <laughs> A, a cruel uh, that, statement or an yeah, accurate one or a cruelly accurate, accurate statement? There are still a few, but it's fairly accurate, yeah. Right. Um, so IBM's going to let other people take advantage of the power PC architecture or the power architecture. Uh, is anybody going to do it? The the Open Power Consortium? Like Google has joined the Open Power Consortium. NVIDIA right. has joined the Open Power Consortium. Uh, networking chip major... Melnex Technologies, motherboard maker Tyann. So there's there's kind of the the but maybe the core of a blade type, a, the core right. of a blade type architecture evolving here because Google alone could almost make enough of a customer base to sustain. Oh yeah, I mean uh, if you look at those those four companies really make right. up. You take um, the processor from IBM, the GPU from Nvidia, the networking of Mellanox, and the and the 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 company tie-in that will kind of make a board and system out of it. While Google gives them direction on here's what we want and what we need in our in our systems, and I think it makes perfect sense that there, this will be produced. This will be something that is made uh, going forward, specifically for Google, but not just mm -hmm. them, right? So the idea is that they open up their architecture for licensing in the same way that ARM does, and maybe people can find more unique ways to implement right. the uh, power architecture design than they can really get into with their current processor models, right? So it's it's really interesting. Um, it's a dramatic shift uh, over what they had done before. And, and I'm really curious to see what this will be in this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really like a, it's an enterprise server market play than anything else, right? They're not trying to get yeah. into cell phones with this. It's the architecture is not built for that. Uh, but it will be interesting to see, you know, will NVIDIA... Mm -hmm. find a way to integrate a processor into their graphics chips, be able to sell an entire platform to, uh, you know, supercomputing environments, you know, without having to use Intel and their Xeon platforms and, and that kind of stuff. It would be really interesting to see uh, what they can do long term. NVIDIA has already shown that they're willing to dive into other architectures to promote their yeah. own designs, what they did with ARM. There's no reason they couldn't also make power-based designs uh, for the other end of the market too. I mean, it, it, it should be interesting. I think a lot of this comes down to power consumption. And when you when you look at the masses of processors that major companies like like Google and Amazon and, and you know, we could go on for a while listing these just people doing with huge amount Facebook, for example. Right. Um, Facebook's created it's sort of an entire new storage architecture for for media just to be able to shift the thousands of pictures from vacations and and grandma's house and of cats and lol cats that that only get accessed yeah. like once a week or once a month they've they've they're shifting terabytes of data uh, off you know thousands and millions of terabytes of data uh, billions of terabytes uh, of data into these warehouses now where essentially the PCs shut down into or the the server is shut down into a low power state so if you click on an image on Facebook and it takes a couple seconds to kind of res itself up you know you probably hit something in deep storage and it had to sort of there was a query at Facebook it went uh oh gotta go to the warehouse and literally 
applied a power state to that server, launched it back up, and then it grabbed the photo for you to display on your Facebook page. But it's the only way that companies with these ridiculous, huge, insane storage uh, needs can actually afford to keep the, the, the light bills paid, the electrical bills paid. It's, it's kind of right. awesome to watch. Uh, uh, there's some, some more challenges emerge. It'll be interesting to see how that works out. AMD drops the radio on HD 7990 to $699 and throws in eight free games. Should we all buy one now? <laughs> you know, it's a very interesting story now right so it's not a coincidence i don't think that they dropped their suggested uh retail pricing to their adding card partners right after this 13.8 driver came out last week we talked about right. how much it uh fixed and addressed single gpu frame pacing problems right so now if you have a 25 by 16 or 25 by 14 or 19 by 10 monitor um mm -hmm. you know your frame pacing in dx 10 and 11 games is 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 in my opinion fixed it's 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 good enough uh there's room for improvement but it's pretty good um there are still problems that we talked about last week. The X9 isn't supported. Ifinity isn't supported. 4K screens aren't supported. But they are now, the 7990 is now $300 less mm -hmm. than the 690, the GTX 690, and the right. GTX Titan from NVIDIA. So, uh, and, and some of these looks like, like if you go to Newegg, the MSI doesn't have the game bundle still uh, with it, but the Sapphire one does. Uh, XFX does, but HIS does not. So you have to be a little bit cautious which one you actually pick up because it looks like some of the vendors have run out of the the eight free game bundle but i mean mm -hmm. and also had this debate internally here is are these eight games viable now are people still interested in these games about crisis 3 and bioshock infinite and tomb raider and far cry 3 and blood dragon and, and some of these and you know, get into deus ex and those are a little bit old so are these really worth 300 bucks are they worth 200 bucks, mm -hmm. are they worth $100 for these games? Um, <laughs> you know, how many people already own these titles? You know, so you got to consider some of that. But even if you get one right. or two of these games that are worth 30 or 40 bucks a piece, now your $700 card is worth closer to $600 or it costs you uh, closer to $600. So I think it's a, it's a pretty compelling option. I think game bundles, all things being equal, will lean mm -hmm. you in one direction right. versus the other. So... I still think they have a lot of work to do on the 7990, but I am much, much more likely to recommend it for somebody that is not doing Ifinity and doesn't want to do 4K, but they mm -hmm. have one of those monoprice 25 by 14 monitors and they want to get the best possible performance out of it uh, for the lowest dollar. And now the 7, 7990 is about the same price as the GTX 780 single GPU part from mm -hmm. NVIDIA. So it's, it, it's, it's an interesting part now. I, you know, I'm not telling people to rush out and buy these. <laughs> but it's a it's a much better option than it used to be. I, I love the the chart with all of the games on it. This is like North America and Europe, also Australia and New Zealand, and then has this. You know what I mean? Well, it's kind of you laugh, but you rarely get to see sort of like all of the options. Yeah, uh, we we specifically requested and then, this and information all of the GPUs. from them. Yeah, it's like you need to give us a matrix of right. what you get with what, because it's way <laughs> too confusing to like write it out in text. So yeah. we need some kind of visual aid for this. Thank you. I also find it deeply fascinating that you get like Far Cry 3 with the 7990 and the 77, 7770 only. Like <laughs> the the most expensive and the least expensive GPU options uh, yep. to get one of the best games. That's kind of, I find that funny. Bioshock Infinite, which a lot of people are still interested in. Um, yep. There's some, there's some good games it. on that list. There are. If you haven't played it. If you haven't played it. Oh my goodness. We should take a moment uh, to thank our friends over at Ting. I'm quite sure you've heard me talking about Ting. Uh, Ting is, uh, well, there are no BS mobile service. I have two devices on Ting right now, um, a mobile uh, hotspot, a wireless modem, and a uh, Galaxy Note 2, uh, which is something I'm going to eliminate all the Samsung software off in the immediate future, but that doesn't really have a lot to do with this. What does have a lot to do with this is, is Ting's really cool in that they are trying to make it cheap and easy 
to own a cell phone or own a modem uh, and to make the situation as manageable as possible. It's it's really cool, right? So Ting's an, an MNVO, a reseller of Sprint services nationwide. Um, you own your device. That's the big difference. Like traditionally in America, you buy a cell phone, it's a two-year contract, and you get all of the services. You get all of the text messages and the phone service and the data, uh, but you end up paying... In the course of that, you end up paying, let's say, $2,000, $3,000 over a couple of years. Uh, in the case of the, let's, let's say, my example at home, um, you know, for, you know, $1,200 worth of phones. And with Ting, you buy your phone. You don't have to spend $600 on a phone. Uh, you choose your monthly rates. You're looking at those right there. And you start with extra small, right? You start with zero. And then they automatically adjust what you pay based on the amount of data or minutes you use or text messages you make. So you, what you can do is not get screwed on your phone bill. If you only use your, your, your wireless modem every other month, it sucks to pay 60 bucks every other month. With Ting, you're going to pay six bucks a month, plus for the, the data you use for the devices. There's no contracts. There's there's no early termination fees. Uh, there's no weird charges. There's no weird line items on your bill. They're not going to charge you additional for voicemail or caller ID or tethering or hotspots or three-way calling. You get it all from Ting. Uh, you get a great control panel. You can manage everything for all of your devices off of one single login on Ting. It works really, really well. I love their customer support. Customer support is not something I'm used to saying I love from anywhere, but Ting, when I wanted to move a device on the Ting, and that's a great thing to do if you have a contract on Sprint, you got a device that's lapped, you want to try to save some money, take a look at the calculator on Ting, see how much money it might save, um, and they will help you if they can bring it over. They will help you port the device over. It's pretty simple. Um, my interactions with Ting customer service have been fantastic. Like I've called them up, somebody's answered the phone. You know, it's got to be between 8 and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you're a night owl, you might want to send them an email. But it's, it was great. I got off the phone and, you know, almost immediately an email shows up in my inbox that's like summarizes what we talked about, you know, what the next steps are. It's good. I really like them. Help.ting.com is a really good group to work with. Um, it's cool, right? Purchase your mobile device from Ting or, or arrange with them to import a device, bring a device in there. Uh, activate your device with Ting. Uh, you get to import your old number or get a new one. And Ting will break out your rates by minutes, text messages, megabytes. And they bill you at the end of the month for what you use. It's fascinating to me, right? Uh, as somebody who spent hundreds, if not thousands, on a data modem that was often not used for five or six weeks at a stretch and then would be used right. intently and then not used again. I have saved a lot of money by, you know, using Ting uh, for my, my my mobile data services. It's cool, man. Twitch.ting.com is the place to visit. Uh, save money, better manage your mobile phone usage with Ting, and check out their savings calculator. See how much you or your company can save. And because you're a Twitch viewer, uh, we want to help you save some money. You can save $25 on your first Ting device when you sign up, but only if you visit twitch.ting.com. Start saving today, people, and support Twitch. Help keep us bring in this weekly news and question festival to you, twitch.ting.com. And we want to thank them for supporting This Week in Computer Hardware. Thank you very much. Dude, get excited. <laughs> Just, I love cutting my cell phone bill. It makes me so happy. Um, you know, you know what makes me happy, Patrick? Do you remember white <laughs> PCBs? There were never enough any... of them. Yes, no, there were I, never. I swear, I saw at least one motherboard a thousand years ago. There was, um, there was, was a Soyo. There was a Soyo motherboard that I had. Uh -huh. uh, that'll tell you how long ago that was. I'll show you a motherboard that had a white <laughs> PCB. And I've asked other board vendors about it. And apparently right. the reason not many people do it is that it's a very um, difficult process, a very intricate process. Like there's a lot more steps you have to get in order for it to maintain that color throughout the really? process and not easily fade. Um, and the reason I bring this up is uh, we, I, we posted a story about there's a, there's a new Galaxy GeForce GTX 780 card. They call it the Hall of Fame edition. and <laughs> It's really cool because it's super highly overclocked, but I'm more impressed with that white PCB. It just pretty. looks cool. Now, the problem <laughs> is we don't have any white PCB motherboards anymore to go along with it. But this sitting in your case, if you've got a window, you know, you right. put, a, a, put, a, put a white LED in there with that where it doesn't change the color of it, where, you know, we'll turn it any other color. Uh, it will actually <laughs> look really, really, really good. And if you um, do want to, if you put a red LED in there, it will probably 
it will tint the PCB red as well as it just kind of bounces off of the of the white coloring on there. So it's actually, I just thought it was really cool looking. It's not it really cool worth. Looking. I mean, we didn't. We don't have a review of it or anything like that. It's a right. good-looking card with a great cooler, and it's <laughs> it's, it's overclocked, like by 150 megahertz over the default GTX 780 clock. So that's pretty impressive. I think it's the highest clocked air-cooled GTX 780 on the market right now. Hmm. Uh, but it also looks pretty neat. And it's so pretty. I'm gonna try to get one, and then I don't know what I'm gonna do because I don't have a motherboard. You like. We we did a system review today of a of a of a system that came in a white case. And I was thinking this would be perfect in that. You put some white LEDs in it, you get white tubing for water cooling. Um, but then you don't have a white motherboard. I don't know what to do about that. So you you build some sort of a lid or a cover or a plate. Um yeah, okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. The it, Asus right? the Asus Tough series has that thermal armor on it. Maybe we could paint that white. Oh my goodness. Now okay. I want to go up. Like, I, I'm kind of funny. Like, now on uh, mnpctech.com, they have a great Twitter feed uh, that sends, oh. they send out a lot of really cool mods. And now I'm wondering, like, do they have anything you could hide your, your motherboard behind? Um, Duct tape. They have blue metal flake film. So you could actually put film on your case and make it look like a bass boat. That makes me so happy. And I'm going to change the story lest I sound even less sophisticated yeah, right. than I usually yeah. do. What? You don't like Metal Flake bass boat paint colors? On, uh, maybe not. I don't know. You don't even know what Sorry. I'm talking about, do you? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe not. I don't know. I'll find a picture and we'll we'll okay. post that by the end of the show. Uh, is Moore's Law back on track? Which could beg the question. I didn't realize that Moore's Law was off track. I just assumed that Intel was slowing things down because they didn't need to move that fast anymore. Um but it's interesting. Uh, extreme UV progress, writes ArsTechnica.com. Quote, long-awaited improvements in photolithography could pave the way for the continued shrinking and scaling of microprocessors into the second half of this decade and beyond. Um, you know, <laughs> Moore's Law, which says that the transistor densities double every 24, 18 or 24 months is not some inevitable consequence of physics. Rather, it's an observation of the way the semiconductor industry has evolved. The investment in technological progress that companies like Intel have made results in an approximate doubling of transistors densities on a regular basis. And the issue, right, that we've had is... is we are running into the limit, and when I say we, I mean the unbelievably smart people at Intel and AMD and 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 uh, ARM and everywhere else that they they design and engineer uh, uh, processors is the limitations of copper wiring. Like you get to a point where if you shrink, if you shrink the die enough, and the copper sort of traces get close enough together, you still generate so much heat that you start to have the problem of what, melting the copper wiring into a giant puddle instead of a transistor? Um, right. <laughs> uh, Never but good. the reality is, it's, well, it's funny. It's like, you know, it's, it's, there's the, it's, and let me just read Ars Technica since I'm assuming they're better, uh, they're better at this than I am, but it's like the size of the pattern that be, that can be created on the photoresist layer is the limiting factor. Um, Higher transistor densities require finer mask patterns and shorter light wavelengths. Here's the pressing issue. Current photolithography uses ultraviolet light with a 193 nanometer wavelength, but at some point in the near future, probably around the 10 nanometer process, an ex switch to extreme UV or EUV with a 13.5 nanometer wavelength will be required. Um, and EUV has been coming since the late 1990s. <laughs> so, nice. uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see if it's actually finally here. I don't know if you, Burke, if you can show that crazy machine they have about halfway, two thirds of the way down the page. Um, but a company called ASML uh, that that provides most of the world's photolithographic equipment says, quote, they could have told hot hardware, they could have production ready commercial equipment by 2015 suitable for producing chips with 10 nanometer features. Um Making chips is really hard. Like we take it for mm -hmm. granted. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are very uh, few companies in the world that can do it well and reliably. Yeah. And that's yeah. and it's <clears throat> it's kind of a credit to Intel uh, that they've been so good at it for so long mm -hmm. without really a whole lot of hiccups in the way, uh, along the way rather, um, to 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 be able to produce and, and still stay on, on top of things as they are. So it takes a lot of money and investment, a lot of research and an engineering investment. 
There you have it. It's going to be interesting. And basically the, the, the summary is that if, you know, EUV lithography, photolithography does not come online in time, Moore's law could be interrupted. So it'll be interesting to watch that evolve. And, and when we say disrupted, it also could mean that simply that we're, we may still have power increases. They just may involve dyes getting larger again, which would be kind of strange and terrifying. Actually, it wouldn't be strange and terrifying at all. It would just be kind of peculiar. Press releases would start claiming how they have the biggest die size instead of the smallest die size. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's the way it works. Happy yeah. 10th anniversary to my favorite source of teardowns and repair info, ifixit.com. Uh, I know you've heard us mention this answering questions on the phone, and occasionally we've shown teardowns. Uh, they did a big uh, website redesign, but it's the 10th anniversary of this site that, for me, has been the source of keeping iPhones alive. <laughs> uh, and and Macintosh systems. The article you just said was the 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 blog post that celebrates 10 years of iFixit, and that particularly raw website they started with uh, helping people repair PowerBook G3s and iBooks and PowerBook G4s. Um, but what's great, if you go to the regular ifixit.com website, um, they sell tools and they give you free repair guides that you can access even if you don't buy your repair parts from iFixit. So yep. what's been interesting is they've been working really hard. Kyle and the crew have been working really hard over the last couple of years to expand it beyond sort of, you know, iPhones and iPods and Macs uh, uh, to, you know, game console repair, phone repair, car repair, plumbing, the idea that they want to yep. enable an entire culture around repairing things and making rather than sort of like throwing it out and installing, uh, you know, starting over with something new. Uh, yep. Macintosh repair is still the strongest, uh, uh, strongest uh, area there, but uh, there's an amazing amount of phone and game console repair information. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, they, mm -hmm. without, without the iFixit guides, I would probably be several thousand dollars poorer, or I just would be, <laughs> carrying a really jank phone <laughs> especially <laughs> after the terrible baby drool incident with my iphone 3gs and the worst way to go i fix it way to go kyle and way to go in helping people fix their gear rather than yep. throw it out i have a question for you sir okay have you ever lost your house key um, I do not currently have a house key, so I guess that qualifies as a guess. Because <laughs> your wife doesn't trust you with one or because your house doesn't lock? So I have I always grew up using the garage door, like the keypad on the on the code on the door. Really? So I never really had a house key. And uh -huh. uh, when I bought my own house, they gave me keys. And I like never, I just never bothered to put one on my key ring, actually, because it's like, well, I can always get in the garage door. Now, that has not always been the case. There have been instances where I have needed a key. <laughs> uh, say the electric was out or right. I locked myself out of the house. That has happened a couple of times um, where it would have been nice to have one. Yeah. Can it's something funny. help me? Uh, yes, actually it, it can. It's kind of odd. I, I am deeply fascinated by this. Uh, so I just wanted to share it, but uh, there's a, a startup called Kimi and it is the most peculiar thing I think I've ever seen uh, while we're talking about these strange mix of software and hardware. Pull that back up again, Burke. You basically have the entire thing there. You take a picture of your key. You lay your key down on a sheet of white paper and scroll up a little bit and, and take a look at the app there. Um, and it fundamentally digitizes the information and oh. you can take it to a locksmith, a, a locksmith that supports their service, which is probably a very short list right now. And they can cut you a key based on the photo you took. Um, so I'm 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 kind of curious uh, to see how this ends up because it's, it's funny because it, it just thinking in terms of security it's been a strange week because of DefCon was a sort of the ultimate expression of fear doubt and uncertainty uh, you know because it, it, DefCon seemed to be all about sort of the giant gaping holes in the Internet of Things uh, right. and, and taking over cars and and we had a funny email a couple of emails we were going to talk about on Texel on Monday from viewers that were like well they had to be inside the car to take over the braking and steering functions of the car and they had to get in behind the dashboard of the car to do that and I'm like yeah yeah you know and, and wireless networking used to be like two big bricks that were six feet apart um, yep. but technology advances and it's nice to know the gaping holes and security are there, but it's interesting because we're, we're seeing a lot more stories about 
things like, uh, you know, people finding out that they've accidentally exposed the ability to control all of their sort of Insteon, you know, controlled uh, uh, lamps and devices inside of their house. But the idea that, you know, if somebody can, if somebody can hack into your house or if somebody, you know, if somebody can hack into your house or accidentally take over control of your house, imagine coming back from vacation to like a $2,000 heat bill because um, <laughs> somebody yeah. turned the heat up to, you know, a thousand degrees. But it's interesting watching the security stuff out there. And I thought it was kind of fascinating seeing just this strange intercourse between uh, something as mundane as a key uh the ability to sort of create that. And it's like, well, I'd be able to take any key I take a picture of to any locksmith. So, I mean, if I can just get a hold of Ryan's keys for 30 you seconds. You can just photocopy Ryan's and steal all my stuff. That's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you tell everybody about this? Oh, well, no. you don't have keys. Oh, we'd that's have true. To, okay. We'd have to get the key code for the garage out of you, apparently, to steal all of your stuff. <laughs> and the truth that's is, that's all true. of your really expensive stuff, other than your golf clubs and your Mercedes, are all in the freaking lab at work anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I have keys for that. Now it's even worse. Oh, jeez. Oh I just, I just thought that was fascinating. Uh, I, 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 I it is, that. it is pretty cool. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's, it is a, almost like having one of those uh, uh, 3D printers, kind of, right? Kind of. Kind of. Kind You're of. taking data. You have this <laughs> solid object that's almost in the shape you need already, right? And you just happen to cut a little bit of it out instead it's, of adding. We've been having the craziest time learning how to use the 3D modeling software to create things that we can print in 3D. Um, yeah. 3D modeling software will be the death of me. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> nice. I'm just saying. Do you want to tell people about ProXPN or other sponsor of this episode of Twitch? I sir? absolutely do. ProXPN, if you guys are not familiar, is a global VPN, which is a virtual private network. It works with almost any internet connection. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel through which all of your online data passes back and forth. Uh, any online application can work with Pro XPN, including your web browser, your email, your instant messaging, your file sharing, all of that stuff works through Pro XPN, and it keeps everything you do online hidden from prying eyes, disguising your physical location, and giving you unfettered access to any website or online service, no matter where you live or travel to. So I do travel a lot, and I've often thought about, you know, well, actually, here's, here's a good case, right? So I travel. I, I uh, like to watch my sports. Uh, in some cases, when I'm out of town, uh, the online streaming for a lot of the uh, uh, sports venues, football, baseball, whatever it is, kind of mm -hmm. restrict you based on your location. So if you could, you know, register at your location through the, through the virtual private network, then you would not have that issue Perhaps if you were able to, you know, if I was out of the country, I could still watch any of my streaming video uh, without having to worry about any of those geographical restrictions. Um, ProXPN does offer online privacy through a 512-bit encryption tunnel. It works through Open, excuse me, OpenVPN or PPTP, your choice. It can protect you against your ISP's six strikes rules or keep your personal inter internet usage private at, private at work and help to uh, bypass filtering and blocked websites. You can use it to bypass geographical restrictions for internet content and online video with worldwide servers in the U.S., U.K., Asia, and more. It makes your internet connection region-free, essentially. It uh, has software for Windows and Mac, offers advanced controls, allowing you to select programs and ports you want to anon anonymously route through ProXPN's servers. It also works with your iOS and Android device, allowing you to use your data plan or public corporate Wi-Fi with complete and total privacy on the go. No app required. They have world-class customer support, and even Steve Gibson gave it a great review on security now. So what do you have to do to try this out? You go to proxpn.com slash twit for more information and to sign up. ProXPN premium accounts are normally $9.95 a month uh, or $74.95 for an entire year. We've got a special offer for our viewers and listeners, though. Use the code TWICH, T-W-I-C-H, to receive 20% off for the lifetime of your account. That's less than five bucks a month on the yearly plan. If you're not satisfied, you can cancel within seven days for a full refund. So go to proxpn.com slash twit and sign up with the code twitch. We thank ProXPN for their support of this week in computer hardware and a handy service as well. Very handy service. Thank you, ProXPN.
I uh, was trying to find the perfect metal flake paint picture to <laughs> instill an incredible level of desire inside of you oh, for a, just a, to a, bring it out. Okay. Right. A metal flake. Cause I know if you just saw the right one, you'd be like, Oh yeah. Metal flake. pro metal flakes. Okay. All right. Well, we'll find one by the end here. I'm telling you, man, they're there. I got an email from Dave about an M SATA port on a Z77 board. It says, just recently built a new system because my i7 920 machine died, which is a story in itself. Don't say that, man, because I'm running a core i7 920 at home. He's got a Gigabyte GA Z77X UD 5H motherboard and Intel i7 3770 CPU with a stock cooler. Temps are running 35 to 40 degrees Celsius normally, not overclocked ever. 32 gigabytes of Kingston Black RAM. Yes, he noticed that Windows 7 uses no page file at all. Not at least I've ever caught it doing so. Two plug-in, three-and-a-half-inch SATA hard disks on a front panel, boot and data for all sorts of OSs by uh, Antec Easy SATA adapters, Antec 650-watt EarthWatts power supply unit. You need to point out to people that an active PFC PSU needs a true sine wave UPS. Good to know. The motherboard comes with an MSATA connector built in. My question is, Why? What good is MSATA and why would I want to use it? This motherboard has a UFI BIOS that can be set for legacy non-UFI BIOS operation, which I have done. My real problem is that it only allows two choices for boot device, not the usual three. If I have it set for CD-ROM and hard disk, there's no direct way to use a USB stick without jumping on F12. And I only get a few seconds for that. And am I doing something or I have set something wrong? Probably. Um, and that probably was his teasing Dave, teasing himself, not me teasing Dave. So Dave, <laughs> awesome email. I am jealous of your performance. Should we start with, with why you might want M SATA and if there's any sure. point to it, if you already have uh, a SATA drive. So uh, why would you want M SATA is, you know, you, you, it's just another, it's another expansion port, right? So if you have, right. if you buy an M SATA SSD, 120 gig SSD, then you can make that your primary OS partition and you don't have to worry about having a three and a half or two and a half inch SSD in your system. You don't have to take up a SATA port with it, right? So there, right. there's advantage that way. You could also use that for the Intel SR, is it SRT, Smart Response Technology, something like yes. that, uh, or RST, Rapid Storage Technology. I can't remember which one it is. <laughs> it's one of those, but it is an SSD caching technology, right? So if you only had right. like a one terabyte hard drive, you could put a 40 or 60 gig SSD, maybe that's a little too big, maybe 40 to 30 gig <laughs> SSD in that slot, enable right. the Intel caching technology, and then you don't have to worry about having another external drive connected to your system to enable that caching. So that's why motherboards implement MSATA right. connections on there. Uh, and I, I find it to be kind of useful. Like now I build systems more often than most, and I use them for less periods of time than most. Right. So it's kind of handy to have an MSATA, just plug in there, put the little screw in, uh, hook up a power supply, boom, and I can start installing, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an operating system. I don't have to worry about connecting right. a SATA cable or connecting a, a power connection to an external drive as well, which is nice. I mean, it's also, it's simply like if you need huge amounts of storage and you don't want to spend the money on an SSD, right, you, you get an MSATA drive, which is relatively, inex relatively inexpensive, and then you have your terabytes yep. of storage on the device and you still get cool guy uh, SSD performance without having to spend all the money on an SSD, dot, dot, dot. That argument is becoming less compelling as the cost of SSDs continues to drop. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if those uh, ports start to disappear off motherboards in the none too distant future. Uh, note, I could be wrong because, you know, the parts count isn't that huge on motherboards these days. Um, now, the question about the Eufy BIOS is, uh, and and wanting to, it's kind of funny. Like I don't think I've used three boot devices in a couple of years now. Uh, yeah, have at they least started to I cut don't, that back. Um. So he, I think he says the answer to his problem right here. He's, right. He says is that it only allows two choices for boot device, not the usual three. Uh, I don't, I don't know if that is because you have disabled Eufy as as the primary way of booting. To me, that doesn't make any sense. I've, I haven't seen any limitations to two boards on that and especially on a, like an enthusiast level consumer product like the gigabyte uh, z77 x ud5 h it may be that you're just not looking right. in the right spot or maybe um you know that's you're, you're looking under a different menu you need to look for boot priority instead of boot modes or boot options or something like that i don't have that board handy or anything like that so i don't i can't say for sure 
Uh, but if you have a set for CRAM and hard drives, there's no way to do use the USB stick. I, right. Are, are you still booting from optical discs? If so, <laughs> maybe consider converting those over to USB drives, right. and then you don't have to worry about it. Then you can just set it to USB and hard drive. That's that's the way we go for everything. USB is primary. Uh, right. SSD storage SATA is secondary. So, I mean, the truth is, is, is if you do find yourself, I mean, I would set it to USB, and then if you do find yourself with a strange and wondrous need to boot from a CD-ROM or you know a DVD drive, you know, maybe you have a a, a, a DVD based Windows Seven installation, and you don't want to bother downloading the image uh, online for that and putting it on a a USB stick, just hit F12. Worst case, you know, you control alt delete a couple times, so yeah. you hit F twelve yeah. in that time space. It's just I think it's just uh, I think it's just one of the weirder, smaller levels of streamlining that's that's showing up in the UFI BIOSes. Well, they're not BIOSes, but <laughs> the, we know what you mean. the thing that, that has replaced the BIOS. Well the, the, the thing formerly known as the BIOS, but Right. I don't know. I mean, Eufy is so much easier to use in so many ways. Uh, I can live with not having five boot options anymore. I always, you know, at some point, I think they just started adding more boot options just because they could. We want to give you the option of being able to boot off of any port on the motherboard. Um, <laughs> Forever and ever. We got an email from the ironically named Kelvin about a beverage fridge. I'm surprised nobody suggested using a beverage fridge as an ancillary device and component box. How about a test to tell us the cumulative wattage capacity and corollary power cost per month for a beverage fridge that can cool a router, switch, NAS, micro PC, et cetera. If Thunderbolt can run the express bus externally from a full-size gaming PC, put the high-performance video cards in the fridge as well. A small grommet hole insulated with a shot of foam would handle the IO, Ethernet, and video cables. No, actually it won't. And I'll tell you why. The, the cooling capacity of your typical dorm fridge is minuscule. Um, it is designed to cool stuff down and not particularly well, but cool it down and keep already cooled devices. It's the reason if you have like a, you, we, we, we freeze a lot of produce at my house. We do a lot of like, you know, we go out, we pick like 50 pounds of organic peaches or something on a Sunday morning. And uh, then there's the processing phrase and our new cool guy, cool babe, wife, spouse creature freezer uh, has this quick freeze mode that runs the compressor constantly. You can basically set it up so it runs the compressor for several hours. The reason it does that is because when you move a bunch of heat into the freezer, it has to catch up. And it can take right. a really long time. If you, if you exceed like, you know, X number of pounds per square foot of un, like room temperature, ambient temperature uh, stuff into the freezer, it can be enormously difficult for the freezer to cool that stuff down. And it could uh, create issues for the food that was currently frozen and could be formerly frozen if you stuff too much warm stuff inside of your uh, freezer, right? So right. when you have your dorm fridge or your beverage fridge, right, because your kegerator is essentially a, a slightly larger dorm fridge, um, you don't actually have, you think like it's cold in there. It's really cold. Well, part of the reason it's really cold in there is once it cools everything down, there's all this cold mass inside of the refrigerator that keeps everything cold. And if you put uh, you know, because we routed several dozen feet of copper inside of a dorm fridge a few years ago on system. What we found out is there's not enough cooling capacity inside a dorm fridge to keep a delete expletive uh, PC cool, uh, PC processor cool. And if you threw the GPUs on top of that and a few hard drives, um, you were, you, it would be a nightmare. And I'm not even getting into the issue if you put the GPUs or the hard drives or any other thing inside of there with the condensation issues because frost does not work well on electronics. Well, it works great on electronics. The electronics don't work well when frost gets on there. Um, <laughs> condensation, like, so, you know, if you seal That's everything best, right? and put yeah. it inside of, because I'm going to say, Let's say you get a, let's say you spend, you know, you go a whole hog, you spend $200 on a chest freezer instead of say your, your, your dorm freezer, right? So now you've got a, you know, a five cubic foot chest freezer you fill with bags of ice because that's simple with your cooling uh, uh, hose through it that's going to run to the water block on your GPU and your CPU. That might actually have the cooling capacity to do it. Um, but generally speaking, you know, you might 
be able to get away with a small router inside of your dorm fridge, especially if you had a lot of other stuff and you'd never open the door. But if you open the door a lot, if you put it in an active fridge, I almost guarantee you that condensation would probably just trash the electronics on there. Uh, or maybe so you're like telling you're you're telling Kelvin here <laughs> that it's just not a good idea. It it always sounds like a great idea until you build it and nothing works. Sounded like a good idea to, to me, yeah. Well, I, I think if you used a free if you used like a chest freezer, um, I think it you might have enough cooling capacity to do it. But the average small refrigerator sound very efficient though. No, it's incredible. It, well, well, the, the reality is also is we are so energy sensitive for for good reason, right? The the Energy Star program and, and consumer electronics that and and household appliances is fantastic because mm -hmm. it's forced radical radical upgrades in the energy efficiency of devices. But we don't realize people are like, well, I, I've got to change all of my light bulbs over to to CFL bulbs immediately, and I've got to change all my CFL bulbs over to LED right. bulbs immediately. It's like slow down. Take a look at what you're 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 charging for for what you're being charged per kilowatt hour for that light bulb, right. and you may realize it costs you six dollars a year to run a hundred watt light bulb. Now you may want to be efficient, and you may want to be part of the movement in the United States that wants to minimize energy consumption. And I'm down with that because I want my my well, if I ever have an air conditioner again in August, it's pretty temperate in uh, in in where we live in California. It doesn't get that hot, so we don't need air conditioning. But I I would like to never go through brownouts again. And if if having a million or ten million people in California convert to LED lamps from incandescent lamps means we're that much closer to never having another brownout, I'm good with that. But don't expect a lot of radical uh uh you know changes in your electrical bill because you you move to to led bulbs i am slowly replacing all of the the regular bulbs in the house with led bulbs they work a lot better than cfls but uh it fascinates me you need a whole lot of cooling capacity you know it's kind of funny like you want to figure this out really quickly get a hundred watt incandescent bulb because they still sell them put it inside right. your refrigerator and then see what the temperature is inside of the refrigerator. <laughs> if if the 100-watt bulb Good overwhelms idea. the cooling capacity of your refrigerator, you need more power, Scotty. You need more freezer. <laughs> but, yeah, dorm dorm fridges and, and beverage coolers, they're designed to cool something down, to keep the mass inside of their cool. They do not do well with having additional heat continually pumped into them. Way too much answer for that. I'd like to apologize to everyone in the like audience. It. But I just, I just, right. I, you know, I've been there, and it's like, man, you have a big old chest freezer or access to, like, a, a walk-in freezer. You could do amazing things if you can keep uh, frost and condensation for ruining your gear. Uh, should we do one last question before we go? Sure. Trevor's question. Uh, before we get to our glorious metal flake paint, I found a few examples that I dropped in there, Burke. You can look for them. I wouldn't look for them just yet because they might just blow your eyes back out the... Yeah. Back out the... Well, just you'll see them. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> I'm telling you. Really. I see them flipping. All right, it's go awesome. Ahead. Trevor's got a question about a 21 by 9 versus 16 by 9 monitor. He says, I am interested in purchasing the affordable, found it on sale for $400, AOC 21 by 9 aspect ratio monitor at 2560 by 1080 resolution. The aspect ratio seems it would be a better experience for gaming than a traditional 16 by 9. The alternative is Monoprice's IPS panels. I want to hear your opinions on which you would rather, with, excuse me, so I want to hear your opinions on would you rather game in 21 by 9 or not. Is it often that games support this aspect ratio? Does it seem like 21 by 9 popularity might be on the rise for gaming? I can't stand the bezel in multiple monitor gaming. Why aren't there 21 by 9 monitors with a comparable PPI to the Monoprice IPS monitors? Well, the same reason there's not a lot of 21 by 9 HDTVs. It's not a standard. Because it's not a standard, while you may see something like uh, Vizio announcing this amazing, finally, your CinemaScope movies are going to be like freaking, there's going to be a quarter inch of black at the top instead of the big uh, uh, letterbox. Um, the reality is, is the market's just not that big for it. Um, right. I would also, I also didn't realize that 25 by 60 by 1080 was 21 by 9. Um, um, but uh, I don't um, know if it is. I didn't think it was. I don't think it is. 2560 divided by 1080 is 2.37. So is that right? That's, yeah, it's, so it it's is going to be longer. It's skinnier pretty close. 16 by 9. But, yeah. um, uh, gaming support? Is it going to be out supports, there? I mean, the gaming support's there, right? I mean, any right. resolution that your, that your PC runs at will almost uh -huh. always work in a game. There are a couple of games like... Um, 
Skyrim, for example, if you want to want to play it in Ifinity or one of these larger resolutions, you kind of have to hack an I and I file. But you know, Sleeping Dogs, Bioshock, Crisis, Battlefield, all those games will support wide resolutions. Um, what I would keep in mind about this is 2560 by 1080 is not the same as two 1920 by 1080 screens. So it's a different right. experience than just you know Ifinity with a without the bezel in the middle. Um, <laughs> it is it's interesting. Here's the problem. When you if you've never used a multi GPU or multi display gaming thing, what you don't realize is that right. I, the more you get away from the middle of the screen, the more things kind of stretch because your field of view <laughs> in the game is programmed in a particular way. Right. And, you know, it's not meant to be more than like a 90 degree field of view. So you will never be able to game on that monitor, not with that problem. Right. Um, if it, if it ever happens to bother you, I would personally giving the, given these two options would probably choose the 27 inch, like the monoprice IPS panels. Uh, you can get them for 400 bucks or less, like you mentioned. And you know, they're 2560 by 1440. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a more standard thing. Maybe that's the old fogey in me, you know, <laughs> wanting to stick with, uh, what, what we, what we know works. You just tried the, and true resolution, young man. I, I haven't <laughs> spent enough time <laughs> I've sat at I've sat at these monitors, these twenty five sixty by ten eighties, right. and I've used them for a little bit, but never, you know, for several hours at a time. How does this How does this really feel, um, you know, in that regard? So, it's also, I mean, it's not. If you go twenty five sixty by ten eighty, versus twenty five sixty by fourteen forty, you're getting the same amount of width, right? Right, in terms of pixel density, mm -hmm. but with fourteen forty, you're just getting more height on it too. I, you know, it's, it's the only thing you're really changing is your aspect ratio. You're not really changing what I think is important, like pixel density and that kind of stuff, which really, really kind of can improve your, your, your gaming experience that way. So I would personally go for the monoprice option. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm hundred percent with you on that one. It's, uh, you know, if there was a lot of people doing those monitors, it might be more compelling, but I think it's just, it sound, I think it sounds like a good idea, but I think you're better off, again, like yeah. Ryan said, with a monoprice monitor. Yeah. It's a good theory. But, you know, if it was a $200 monitor on sale, I might be a little more enthusiastic about it. But if you're already paying the WQXA, uh, uh, QHGA, QXA. Right. Uh, 2560 oh, by 1440 prices. I, I don't even yeah. I know. I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> How many smart kids does it take to remember? There's like five or six letters I wisconsin think. quarter horse association the wyoming quarter horse association the wyoming quarter horse association on facebook this is fascinating resolutions doesn't even make it into the top page huh. and if you type in retaliation instead of resolution <laughs> that will get you the right answer would be my guess if it did that'd be qhd resolution which might explain qhd okay why i was getting quarter host associations quarter horse associations instead of uh resolutions wqhd get the get the wqhd monitor trust us and for no other reason that it's just they're beautiful they really really they're are nice Speaking of beautiful, PCPer.com is beautiful, Ryan Shrout. And what will be up on it this week? What excitement can we expect to see? As he looks around the office. Um, <laughs> so we have, we just finished recording a review of the Corsair uh, Carbide Air 540 case. It's a very interesting case. It's kind of like a square where the uh, power supply is not above or below, but instead behind all the other components. It's kind of an inter interesting design that we're going to look at there. Uh, we are working on more of graphics testing because that's the thing to do for me forever, uh, in, in particular in the 4K arena. Being able to test the 4K ASUS monitor that we're still withholding from sending back to ASUS uh, in order Almost to... Done. You know, yeah, yeah, just a little bit longer. One more uh, week. To, to see if we can perfect <laughs> and get our frame rating uh, capture-based performance testing working with that particular configuration. It's a much bigger pain than we might have originally expected, but I think we're we we've got it we've got it nailed down. So I don't know if we'll have that in the next couple of days. Maybe by by this time next week we'll have it. Oh my goodness! I'm sorry for your pain, sir. It uh, happens. We are going through the pain of of figuring out how 3D modeling works uh, and how to create 3D models. Uh, and uh, actually, did, did we tell you that uh, archive.org has all of the MAME images? Like all of the MAME files? No, no, that sounds yeah. pretty sweet. It's pretty wow. epic. So we downloaded uh, 
<laughs> we downloaded gigabytes of it took uh, I think about a day to get everything downloaded but so archive.org which is the internet archive and a place where they have these sort of incredible collections of well the internet wayback machine and and uh, live music archive but essentially somebody set up a MAME archive there um so we're having a, a sort of a how to go from these gigantic downloads to a collection of video games you can play on your PC, uh, classic video games, and then uh, some interesting stuff coming up on HD Nation this week, including Samsung's new Plasma television, which is gorgeous. Not nice. cheap, but unbelievably <laughs> good looking. Well, it's not, it's not, you know what I mean? We're not talking $5,000 here, but we're not talking $900 from, you know, Costco either, but it is, uh, it is gorgeous. Oh my goodness. The blacks, they are inky and delicious. Uh, to use Robert Harrod's favorite phrase. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Burke, do you want to show us some glorious metal flake paint? This is my last chance to convince Ryan that he needs to do his next PC build with a little bass boat action there. Bring it up. Come on, bring it, Burke. Bring it, bring it. Oh, that is glittery. Oh, but it gets more glittery. There nice. it is. I can't <laughs> That's like, like these are like $10,000. So I've paint. seen car finishes with this kind of paint design as well, but usually monocolor, right? So single. Monocolor. Yeah. Yeah, but those I've are, seen, okay. Now I know what we're talking about. All right, those, fair enough. There was a couple monocolor mods in there. I think Burke just, Burke is attracted yeah. to the shiniest of shiny. That could be our sh that could be our title for today's show, the shiniest of shiny. Uh, and with that thought, <laughs> Burke wants that on his motorcycle. Then, then how, I got to get a picture of the motorcycle that's parked around the street from my house that has this amazing, freaking chopped, extended nose, and it's a it's a Honda 750. It's really old school with this amazing metal flake bass boat tank. And since I'm obsessed with Metal Flake, I think I'm going to let Ryan cut me off before Burke starts laughing hysterically and flashing up random pictures from the internet. Uh, so that's it for this edition of Twitch, this week in computer hardware. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schrapp. We'll see you next week on Twitch.